I'm just waiting for the notification on my phone. I see it, I see it. Mm -hmm. I think you're live, Josh. I just got the notification from Facebook. Okay, good. Okay, welcome everyone. We're here live with uh, Dr. Henry M. Carter. My name is Joshua Muhammad. We're here with Miriam Muhammad, Naima Muhammad. We all, everybody say hello. Greetings. Greetings. Excellent, excellent job. Okay, um, Dr. Carter has an extensive background in education. He's an accomplished um, man, mentor, and just great help in the community. And he's been a great help to myself and many of the young men who I work with and a lot of my friends he's put us in and he's one of the main reasons that I'm attending college as we speak. Um, Brother Henry, the first thing I want to ask you is what inspired you to get involved in education? Well, uh, my family uh, has a, a long history in education. We have a lot of educators in my family. Uh, but even beyond education, it's a family calling, a family tradition. I come from uh, a family that's been in the ministry of developing people for over 150 years. And so that has just kind of been passed down to generation to generation is to pour into people and to make them better. And so it was just a natural fit for me to get into education and to get into the personal development business. Mm. Excellent. Naima? Thank you, Brother Henry, for being with us. I have a question about fatherhood. Yes, ma'am. What's the most important lesson fatherhood has taught you? Well, you know, I've been blessed to become a father at a very early age. My first uh, child was born when I was 20 years old. He's 30 and a half right now. <laughs> and I had to get uh, fatherhood training, on-the-job training, if you will, because my first two and uh, three children grew with me, meaning that I was so young, I was going to college, and I had to learn the principles of fatherhood. What was fortunate for me is that I joined the nation at a very early age as well, in my 20s, and I was able to listen to some of the lessons from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad through Minister Farrakhan about what fatherhood was. And, but what, I, what gave me the impetus to be better is that my father was uh, killed when I was two years old. So I didn't have a father prototype to, to use as a model. And I said to myself, that I want to be the father that my father didn't get the opportunity to be. And so that made me understand that if I was going to develop another human being, I had to treat them the way that I wanted to be treated. Mm. Yes, sir. Excellent. Thank you. Me. Um, switching gears a little bit, my question is about relationship. Brother Henry, um, what advice would you give to um, any males out there who may be interested in getting married but a little apprehensive? What advice would you give them about marriage? <clears throat> well, in Egypt, over the pyramids, they have a statement that says, to thy own self be true. I think that an individual must first get to know who they are. They must know what triggers them. They must be transparent with themselves. Because before you match up with someone else, you have to know what, what, what is it that you really want out of life? Where is it that you want to go? And how you plan on getting there? So when you bring another partner into your life, then you're, being able, you're able to articulate that with, with someone. When my wife and I, we're about to celebrate 24 years coming up in January. Congratulations. We, yeah, we followed the, the protocol of the nation, which at the beginning, uh, we had to go through courtship. And as we've been taught by the minister, the word courtship has at the beginning of it, the word court means that we have to weigh the evidence. And I think that individuals who are going into a relationship have to weigh the evidence, meaning that they have to say, do this person have what I need and do I have what that person need? Is there things about that person that I, I may not can live with later on down the road? Uh, they have to weigh the evidence to see if that person brings uh, a certain set of skills and opportunities to the table because a relationship or marriage 
It's really a partnership or a merger of two individuals who intend to grow together. And so after the courtship, we went into the engagement. And we didn't even bring our families into the relationship, into the engagement. Because if the evidence didn't weigh up, then there was no love lost. I didn't want to emotionally tie my family to someone who evidence said that they were crazy. I didn't want to introduce them. I didn't want to introduce my family to a sister, you know, later, you know, later on I found out that, you know, she had some triggers that I mean I could deal with. When we had the engagement, I did a dinner. And I had the family to interview her and her family interviewed me and they gave us feedback. And based on the initial evidence, the feedback from the family, I said to the sister, I think we done passed the test. Let's, let's, let me put a ring on it. <laughs> and uh, she said yes. And uh, we still kicking 24 years later. Crazy. Yes, sir. That's beautiful, Brother Henry. Okay, Brother Henry, I had a question. Um, what, what are some of the, um, the obstacles that you've had to overcome in your professional life? Well, you know, uh, in a Christian society, uh, we still had to deal with some prejudice uh, uh, being a Muslim. I had some people who uh, initially uh, had some issues with me being a Muslim, but then what I realized that if you make a better mousetrap than your neighbor, if you do, if you if you're a subject matter expert in what you do, the whole world will make a beacon path onto your doorstep. And so what that did, it made me become better. And as I became better they got over their prejudice and their biases of me being a Muslim. So I think my religious belief was an initial hurdle uh, for me to advance in my career. Uh, I was working for the YMCA and a lot of people don't understand the YMCA means the Young Men Christian Association. They have mm. changed their brand to call themselves the Y. So here I am, a young Muslim in a young, young men's Christian association. But when they became more mature in their understanding and I became more proficient in my profession, uh, that erased very, that, that eventually erased. Yes. Excellent. Naima? Brother Henry, what's the biggest difference between raising sons versus raising daughters? You know, just secular speaking, outside of a spiritual realm, we, we see our daughters uh, as our responsibility to protect. And a lot of men suffer from guilt, whether women know it or not. We know what we've done to women. We, we know what we said to, to get women to succumb to our will. And we're afraid that some brother with a slick tongue gonna say the same thing to our daughter. And we gonna reap what, and we gonna reap what we sow. And so we're, we're very protective of our daughters because we know there's some brother out there gonna try to get, grab her. And so we, with our sons, we teach them how to be hunters. And that's unfortunately, we tell them, go out there and find a woman and do whatever it takes to beat the competition. Uh, mm -hmm. Cause there's a lot of competition out there. If you got to be faster, if you got to be smarter, if you got to be more courageous, do whatever it takes. And uh, I understood that my intellectual prowess uh, was going to give me a competitive edge. Uh, I was born vertically challenged. That's the politically correct way mm -hmm. of saying that my height wasn't as at the stature that I would want it to be. <laughs> and I and I knew that I had to use different tactics to to win the, the women over. And I realized that my intellect and my uh, compassion and my respect for women would make that happen. And uh, that's the difference that we teach our men how to hunt and we protect our, our women pretty much out of uh, the need of uh, uh, making sure that they are not uh, taken by the hunter. So it's a, it's a very delicate balance. But spiritually, uh, we know that the woman is the uh, co-partner with the creator of all the worlds. And we know that we have a responsibility to protect her mind, her body, and her spirit. And we've been taught that she's the first teacher. And if we don't protect this, the woman from all of the negativity out here, her eye gate and her ear gate, then we're dooming our children and future generations to be damned by the wickedness of this world. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Go ahead, Rahim. Maybe. Um, 
My next question for you, Brother Henry, is what do you think is the biggest misconception about marriage? The, mis mis the biggest misconception is that people have is that they think that once they say I do, they're one. The biggest misconception is, is that a lot of people are looking for, for perfection. We've been messed up through fairy tales and fantasies that uh, we're going to find the, the, the total package. Uh, women are looking for a man tall, dark, and handsome. And a brother is looking for a woman with curvaceous hips and that she can cook and she can, she's, she should, she can do everything to make you happy. But the truth of the matter is everybody's stuff stinks. Everybody's stuff stinks. Everybody feet stinks. Everybody breath stinks. My point is, there is no perfection, so stop looking for perfection. And that's what people are looking for. Uh, I think sometimes in the nation, we have the what we I call the MGT and FOI fantasy. You know, when you look at a brother standing on post, he's cracked, he's, he's sharp, he's coming there. Oh, he's like, oh God, he's, he's the best thing since, since uh, whitey fish and, and cabbage, right? <laughs> But the, and then he get home, that brother throwing his drawers on the floor. The sister said, oh, mama, I don't know what I done got into. Sister, sister been lying to the brother. She been using other sister's bean soup to entice him. Like, oh, she can cook. She get home, it's rocks in the bean soup. And the brother like, what did I get into? And so I think that a lot of people go into relationships with fantasies. I think you have to learn how to discipline your disappointments. Mm -hmm. You have to learn how to discipline your disappointments. You know, and, and you know, my wife, and, and you know, she's, you know, she's evolved to become a very proficient cook over the years, but she didn't go into the kitchen. Uh, her mother is a great cook, but her mother did not want to impose upon my wife the stress and strain that her mother put on her. So she didn't force her daughters to come in the kitchen. So I had to learn to respect uh, her, her desire to learn how to cook. And at the beginning, that was some problems for me. I was like, God, I was eating twice. Can I, I just have to be true for now. I was eating at home and then I was going out to eat again. Oh my God. <laughs> but you know, I had to make sure that she understood that I value her and over, over the period of time. Uh, I started just eating at home. So my point is, stop going into these relationships looking for the perfect mate because the perfect mate does not exist. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Not even Beyonce, Henry. Not even Beyonce, huh? Beyonce feet stink too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But Henry, what you, you have, from my observation of you and my experience of dealing with you since I've been in Atlanta, you have a, a strong love for the youth. What, what has... What made you love the youth the way you, that you do? You know, I believe that we all have a moral obligation to pour into the young people uh, all of the wisdom that we have ascertained over the short journey that we've been on this planet. And the youth are more receptive uh, to receiving knowledge. Uh, they are hungry for something new. And it's always exciting to see that light bulb come on in their head when they're learning something new. And I feel so empowered to share with them uh, uh, best practices that would make them a better person. And so I just joined on very early in developing young people uh, because there were people who poured into me. I grew up in Chicago. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, my father was killed when I was younger. And there was a teacher by the name of Mr. Philly he poured into some of the young men who had the most problems. And I was a problem child. It wasn't nothing for me to turn over a desk in the classroom because I was dealing with so much at home. And he pulled about five of us to the side, started mentoring us, taking us to Northwestern football games, Pizza Hut and all of those kind of things. And I began to become a better person. And I decided that I would give back to those young people that which has been given to me. And by the grace of Almighty God, I've been able to pour into tens of thousands of young people all over the world. That's good. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Naima. What advice would you give for future fathers or soon-to-be dads? I say that, you know, make sure that you got your ducks lined up in a row. The uh, biggest challenge for most relationships and most fathers is to provide, protect, 
and profess. That's the three things that men do. We, we are taught to provide for our families, profess our love for our family, and to protect our family. And a lot of young brothers out here have, been, have not been adequately trained to provide for our families. We have to learn how to produce. You have to have that hungry grind in you to make sure you're going to do what is necessary to put bread on the table and put clothes on your family back. And I, had, I learned that earlier. You know, I, I, my first job was delivering the Chicago Times newspaper at the age of 13 at 3 o'clock in the morning prior to me going to, going to school. I had to deliver 100 newspapers. And my mother could not afford to buy us Chuck Taylors. Chuck Taylors was like the Jordans of the day. We used to have a saying, don't get the kind that slip and slide. Get the kind with the star on the side, right? And we wanted the Chuck Taylors, baby. And mama kept buying me these old hard shoes from Kmart that make you slide across the floor, but that was the best she could do. I understood early that I had to provide for myself. So I went and got that paper job. I got my check and I went and brought me and my brother some Chuck Taylors. And that sparked into me the desire to get up, get out and do something and, and make sure that I can provide for my family. When my mother food stamps ran out because just like a lot of parents back then, they sold some of their food stamps and we had two weeks left and uh, the government cheese ran out. I had to get out there and, I, and there was a place behind us that sold Italian beef and hot dogs and uh, french fries. And I told the man, if I sweep your parking lot, if I, if I clean up, will you give me some Italian beef and hot dogs so I can feed my family? And he said yes. So I learned very early to provide for my family. I think men have to learn how to provide for the family. And then we have to learn how to profess our love. A lot of brothers are emotionally immature. We talk yes. to hold our emotions in. We don't know how to say, I love you, you know? And we're gonna have to say to our, learn how to, to be transparent with our emotions and say, hey, I love you, I love my children. I tell my son, he's 12 years old, I hug him and I love him every day. I tell my wife I love him, I tell my daughter to love. And then the final thing that I said is to protect. So brothers gonna have to learn how to protect. If you don't know how to fight, you don't know how to stand up for your family, then you need to go take some karate class, some boxing classes. <laughs> you need to learn how to throw a rock or something uh, because your family at the end of the day wanna make sure that you can protect them. And uh, that comes with having courage and having manhood. I think that in a society that has made men more kinder and gentler, that we have a lot of brothers who don't adequately know how to protect their families. And the women know that. And so many of them are dissatisfied and they pulling up and, 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 and role reversing because the man has not learned how to do his job. Hmm. Actual facts. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Brother Henry. Go ahead, Mimi. Um, my final question, Brother Henry, is what qualities do you think are necessary for a successful marriage? Oh is the, the, to love one another for who they are. You know, my wife is a ride or die sister. Yes, and, yes, yes. and 24 years, she hasn't seen me grown, you know. I mean, I'm a go-getter and my job, my career has taken me to various cities. I'm gonna tell you something, you know, with this ride or die. When I came, when I uh, came to the nation, as I was in college, I graduated from college, I got a good job right out of college. I mean, they were paying me good money, good benefits and everything. And then Minister Van Muhammad was the regional minister at that time. He said, Brother Henry, you can speak well. Come on up to Atlanta. I want you to work with me in the ministry. So I came to Atlanta in the ministry. And then I got to speaking on the roster and I was assisting him in the ministry. I was called the, the Baptist Muslim preacher. And I was preaching, and Minister Van said, Brother Henry, I want you to go down to Columbus, Georgia. And I came home to my brand new wife. I mean, we were brand specking new. I mean, we still had we still had wedding cake on our lip. That's how new we were <laughs> in the mix. And I said, I'm getting ready to quit my job, and I'm going down to Columbus, Georgia to be the minister for the Nation of Islam. And she said, how are we going to make money? I said, you got to have faith, woman. You got to have faith. <laughs> And we went down there, boy, and, you know, and we had a little money in the bank for my wedding. And after a while, that money dried up. And I'm telling you, before I left, this is, this is to just kind of share 
that you got to find a person and, and, and love them for who they are. Our, we ran out of money, everything. I, I decided it was time for me to get out of the ministry and get back into my professional uh, life. Only thing we had in the kitchen, sister, was a bag of bean soup. We ain't had no carrots. We ain't have no celery. We ain't have no spices. We had some soup, some mm. navy bean soup. Mm. And I looked at my wife and she looked at me. And I said, give me 90 days. Mm. And I'm going to grind like I never grind before. And I'm going to put you in a house and you're going to have plenty of food to, to eat. And because she is such a ride or die sister, she believed me. We moved back to Atlanta. I worked 18 hours a day for three months. And I bought her a condominium, a car, and a house full of food. And we've been together. Every- <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. That's beautiful. That's good, baby. Yes, sir. Okay, so my next question is, how has your network helped you in life? You know, we've been taught that the God promised us money, good homes, and friendships in all walks of life. That all walks of life, it means to network and to meet people on all levels. And I have always uh, positioned myself to be a part of organizations that would allow me to meet other people. And so uh, I've joined, when I was younger, I joined the Masonic Order. Uh, of course, I'm a part of the nation. Uh, I uh, joined a, one of the boldest and coldest fraternities out there, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. And uh, uh, I, I network with those organizations. And I realized that the more I shared with people what I had to offer, uh, they were willing to help me. And I think that we in the Nation of Islam fail to understand that we bring so much to the table. We take for granted what we have to offer because we're around so many superstars in the minds. But when we go out there into the, the world, people want what we have to offer. And we become subject matter experts. And so networking is necessary. I have not met a stranger. Anybody I meet, I talk to them. I get to learn about who they are. And I share with what I have to offer. And they share what we have to offer. And uh, I use that to help uh, to build myself and my family. Yes, sir. Excellent. Name? Oh, I don't have any more. Okay, Mimi. Um, so that was it. Okay, um, right here we want to thank you very much. And we want to thank everybody for watching. I want to thank you, Brother Michael. Thank you, Mikhail. Thank everybody who's watching. You know, all the y'all that live, Linda, Susan, Elijah, Dwight. Maurice, everybody, we thank everybody for watching. Brother Henry, we thank you for taking time out of your day. Thank you, Brother Henry. Brother Henry. Well, I thank you all for letting me be on here. You all doing a wonderful thing. And as I say at the end of all of my speeches, I see all of you all at the top because the bottom is way too crowded. Yes, sir. sir. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Make it do what it do. (laughs) Yes, sir. All right, right, take care. Take care.